The topic is monitoring and monitoring for environment, environmental intelligence. Let's welcome Dr. Wang. Um, the title for my presentation is Monitoring and Modeling for Environmental Intelligence. Um, why I put the word um, intelligence here? Um, the reason is if we want to know something, we need to have some hard data. Um, if we do not have any data, we are basically ignorant to what is going on. So uh, our purpose uh, in my sentence is to set up um, to measure uh, a very important climate uh, uh, parameters, uh, that is carbon dioxide. Especially, uh, we are a country which our people are very diligent. Uh, we work very hard, even on Saturdays. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's very important that we understand uh, what's going on about uh, carbon dioxide emissions and also other uh, parameters as well. Next. So the first is the Pacific Greenhouse Gases uh, Measurement Project. Uh, we are very honored to have the great help from the Taiwan Environmental Protection Administration and also Taiwan National Science Council un under the pre uh, previous uh, minister, uh, Professor Lee, so helps to um, initiate uh, this uh, internationally uh, collaborative uh, project. Um, in this project, uh, we can do this by ourselves uh, because we did under them. And uh, we try to measure uh, the carbon dioxide in the area which is typically very difficult uh, to measure, uh, such as over the oceanic um, atmosphere. So to measure the air quantity there, we need to use the ship. So we collaborated with Evergreen Marine Corporations. They have a very splendid and a very beautiful and magnificent ships and operating daily and also routinely over the great ocean of the world. We also uh, collaborated with the China Airlines uh, to take the routine um, air measurements during their routine um, commercial service. So um, in this project, uh, we collaborated with the European um, EAGOS projects, uh, especially with the laboratory from France, Germany, and the United Kingdom uh, as well. Next. So next is our air-based uh, measurements. Um, after, I think, um, about 10 years of hard working with our European partners, uh, finally, we set out the uh, measurement using the China Airlines aircraft. I want to say that this is not a research aircraft. This is a commercial aircraft, the aircraft for making money. But we want to also take some measurement during their routine and commercial service. So we put our instrument, uh, this is a copy uh, where the pilots sit here, and uh, beneath the copy there's an avionic <coughs> section, which is empty sections. And so we can put our instrument here. And uh, during the routine service of this um, commercial aircraft, which is uh, Airbus A340, we can also take a sample measurement. Next. Well, this is our first uh, aircraft to take this sample measurements. And the China Airlines label is, as you see, a very beautiful uh, lady uh, here. And uh, this is uh, the aircraft for climate monitoring. So this is our project. Uh, Logos. We are basically very proud of this aircraft, which is now in operation every day uh, to take a routine measurement um, of aircraft. Next. So, um, this is a quick movie showing you how uh, this uh, method uh, works. Uh, now, so when the aircraft takes off from Taipei, it travels uh, across the North Pacific uh, to the Canada, and it's come back uh, right over the Russian area. So, if there's something happened here, the air has been pumped up into the upper atmosphere, and we will be able to take a measurement over here. And also, when the aircraft uh, flew to the tropical region, we can also take a measurement over here. So, basically, the idea is we measure as long as the aircraft flies. So, that's the basic idea. And that is the beauty of this um, concept. And actually, we are not a person who started. The person who started this idea is a company not a research institute, it's a company called Airbus. The Airbus company who built Airbus airplanes. You see, so those Europeans, they are quite different. They think we do not only want to make money, but we want to also to have some social responsibility to take some measurement using their um, aircraft. Okay, next. 
So um, this is uh, this um, Iago's and the PGG and collaborations. So you can see that the red red line here indicate uh, the measurement from our project uh, associated with the China Airlines, and uh, this is uh, the measurement made by the German um, company called Lufthansa, which is a very big company in the world. So together we can um, collect air qualities in the upper troposphere and the lower stratosphere uh, over the uh, Atlantic <coughs> regions and also over the uh, Pacific uh, areas. Uh, now there's a region which uh, in the southern hemisphere um, still needs to be uh, developed. So in this project, uh, we are talking, uh, we are in the process of collaborating with the company from uh, Australia to help um, to fill the gap in the southern hemisphere. But it is not going to be easy. And I also want to say that this is just like uh, doing a jigsaw puzzles. So piece by piece and step by step uh, with more data uh, available, we will be able to understand what's going on in the air. Next. Next. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, this is a very typical uh, route measurement I would like to show you. Uh, uh, in this measurement, the aircraft took off from uh, Vancouver here, then all the way through back uh, to Taipei. So the aircraft took off at 9 o'clock, and then it goes up. So the black curve here indicates the flight route of that aircraft. So the coordinate is shown here, uh, this in altitude. So when the aircraft took off, the concentration of carbon monoxide is very polluted because the carbon monoxide uh, produced by the combustion from the mobile and also the human uh, activities. So then the aircraft goes up to about uh, 10 kilometer altitude, then it route uh, in this altitude all the way um, back to Taipei. So during the route, you can see <coughs> the blue color here indicate the measurement for the ozone, and then the red here indicate the measurement for the carbon monoxide. So you see, for example, during these hours, the aircraft in this region sample very high ozone concentration. This is a, a typical uh, concentration means the air coming from the lower stratosphere because the ozone is high in the upper uh, atmosphere. And also you see the carbon uh, the monoxide is low, right? Because of how can you get a monos carbon monoxide in the upper air? It's not possible because carbon monoxide is coming from the ground area with the combustion of the mobile. But you see here, in this location, the, even at the 10 kilometer altitude, the carbon monoxide is very high, but the, the ozone is very low. You see this anti-correlation. So this is a good indication of the air, the capability of air in pumping up the pollution from the lower uh, atmosphere into the higher and uh, upper stratosphere at about 10 kilometer altitude. And you know the wind higher up. Uh, travel faster than the wind close to the ground because of the frictional uh, force. So this is the mechanism how the air or how the pollutant can be spread out from the very limited uh, human uh, concentrated area by this uh, very active pumping uh, me me mechanism uh, as it can be shown uh, here. So in this area you can see again this kind of very beautiful um, anti-correlation here. So even by this simple bright loop, you can see a lot of the working mechanism uh, happening uh, in the air. And uh, if we combine with the, uh, the, the Professor Chen's uh, beautiful presentation, this is an area with huge industrial activity and also natural gobi uh, um, activity and also the forest fire and occasionally a meteor strike. Like on the 15th of February, right? So that indicates this area is a very, um, one of the, the areas which can have a lot of pollutant and this kind of truthful process is very important. Now, we go to, to the basic, why do we need this measurement? We have this measurement, then we can refine our models, and the model is uh, the best tool we can use to predict, uh, to understand what's going on now, and also to predict the future. So we can then use this data, to help, to refine, to test, to verify our models for as a tool for the future. Okay, next. And so uh, I will quickly, yeah, so this is another flight rule. So in this case, you see, um, the, the flight is very smooth. 
Well, also, based on this data, you can see the patient joint is very, very smooth slide. And then the brief is very good. You can see be more bumpy because of the convection. Next. Right. Um, next is our uh, ship based measurements. So, this we have collaborated with Evergreen. Uh, very beautiful ships, 300 meters in length, 40, uh, 40 meters in width. Next. So, this is our ships. And we are now in this stage. And also, I would like to say um, this is a great help from the Taiwan EPA to help us operate these nice ships. And uh, we have maintained uh, this routine measurement. Next. Right. So, this is a typical measurement of a Pacific uh, ships. So, uh, here is the show you the concentration um, of the carbon dioxide here. So, I will put a 440 here as a, for your perspective. This is a 388. Uh, measure at the Mauna Loa. So when the ship across this uh, clean area, the concentration is low. However, uh, as soon as the ship uh, cross to the area with the very um, anthropogenic activities, you can see this, uh, the carbon dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide, um, no, carbon dioxide uh, goes up. Um, the lifetime for this species is uh, about 100 years. So this kind of high level is going to disperse uh, gradually uh, over the entire world. Uh, so this is uh, the, the level of the um, uh, carbon dioxide we are going to see uh, very soon. Okay, uh, because of time, let's go to the next break. Um, we also have a second fleet operating uh, from Taiwan uh, down to uh, the equator, then entering the Indian Oceans. And uh, all the way, as you can see, when, as soon as the ship approaching the uh, and so particular area, the concentration goes up, <coughs> and there is uh, races, all the way goes into the uh, Mediterranean. So normally, uh, on this ocean area, it is very difficult to have a carbon dioxide concentration. But based on this measurement, we will be able to understand uh, these concentrations. Uh, what are the most important lessons we have learned? Uh, we find out that our data shows we are not living in this world. This is the real world. So don't be confused by this kind of thing. This is only on a very remote areas. But actually, what is going on is something like this. These are the peak, uh, concentration is going on now every day. Next. Right. So uh, this is uh, our uh, fleet of our measurements uh, since uh, 2009. So we have managed to collect more than 150 uh, crews or measurements, and this data are going to help us to verify the economy model for global carbon cycles, which are very important for the future um, climate uh, verifications. Next. Um, so next, I would like to uh, introduce you the Formosa 3 satellite, which is a very great satellite, which is a, and also a great vision of our uh, president, Professor Fields, and also the President Professor Lee for their uh, vision so that this satellite uh, can be launched uh, in year 2006. Uh, for, our, for, for us, we as atmospheric scientists, we use this, the data collected from this satellite to study temperature change. Yes. So um, basically, you can see that um, our capability to, to measure the air is actually very limited because we only live on a very certain area, like this is the red dot area on land. But this is a big earth. How, how, how do we know what's going on above the ground and also in the open Asian area? So with the satellite coverage you see here, as shown as the green dot, we can understand really and also genuinely on a global scale what is going on uh, in the air. Next. So we can, uh, we have already use this uh, technique to understand the impact um, of the eclipse. So this is a collaboration um, I have with the Professor Liu. Okay, next. Uh, you can see during an eclipse, and uh, this is the center of the eclipse, and we have a, a satellite um, profile, so we can understand the change of the temperature. Next. So during an eclipse, the temperature uh, is the change in the Atmosphere is has become cooler, and but in a low stratosphere no temperature is becoming uh, warmer. So this is a very a significant uh, discovery, indicating the coupling between the uh, troposphere and also lower stratosphere. Next, 
And we also can use uh, this remote sensing to study the effect of the volcano uh, eruption. Next. And, uh, and next. Right, so we study the, and we also publish the impact of the, the volcano eruption in Chiton. Um, right, and next. Right, so you can see uh, this is uh, uh, the satellite remote sensing measurement from Calypso. So in this area. So before the volcano eruption and after the volcano eruption, you can see the existence of the volcano ash. And now what is the impact of all these volcanoes uh, on the temperature? Next. So then we can find out that uh, for these volcano eruptions, uh, basically it has a two to six degree of a reduction in the atmospheric temperature. So we are uh, lucky to not have seen something like a Mount Pinatubo eruption uh, in year uh, 1991. Next. Uh, we also can use this satellite to study the temperature in the uh, um, area, especially in polar region, which are very difficult to get the data to understand what's going on there. Next. So normally, uh, we, uh, the traditional stations, you need to go there to set up a ground-based station. Next. And to get the temperature, people have to go out to release, release the balloon. Next. But to Take this data is a hard work. It is not easy not to be taken for granted. It's a non trivial. Next. But with the remote sensing, we are able to achieve the measurement which is comparable to the man made uh, measurement. So this is quite astonishing. Uh, next. So by this kind of machines, we will help to understand um, what's going on uh, in the polar regions. Um, so, because of the time, I think I will um, just stop here. So, the basic idea here is, at the National Central University, we try our best to set up the platform, to build the instrument, to develop the methods, and to apply uh, these methods to get the data as much we can and also as accurate as possible to help us understand our environment. So, this. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.